good evening, College Park. Y'all look beautiful this evening. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being here to welcome President Barack Obama back to the Peach State. Now, College Park, can y'all hear me all the way in the back? I want you to say this with me now. Say vote. vote. Say vote. vote. Say vote. vote. You sound good. Listen, first of all, I have to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you who knocked on doors, who wrote postcards, who chipped in what you could, who got out the vote. Thank you to all of you for what you did to win those two massive underdog victories to secure the United States Senate majority. You did that. You did that, Georgia. Georgia, you proved the power of our democracy. You proved the power of the vote. Without you, Georgia, there would be no Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. You did that. You did that. Without you, Georgia, we would not have passed legislation to expand broadband internet access into underserved and rural communities. Without you, Georgia, we would not have passed infrastructure legislation to get lead pipes out of our drinking water systems and ensure clean, healthy water for our kids. Without you, Georgia, we would not have passed the most significant strengthening of veterans' health care in a generation. You did that, Georgia. And I want to ask every veteran and active duty service member, please raise your hand and be honored by this crowd for your service. Give it up for those who have served. But Georgia, we still have a lot of work to do. We still have a lot of work to do. My wife, Alicia, can't be with us this evening. She's working the labor and delivery floor at Grady Hospital. And Georgia, the maternal mortality crisis in this state is a shame. The state of health care for our children is a shame. Women who are suffering and dying needlessly in pregnancy and childbirth, that's a shame, Georgia. We've got more work to do. And in Raphael Warnock and Stacey Abrams, we have two public servants who are absolutely committed to lifting up every Georgian, to lifting up our health, to serving all of us. So y'all know we passed legislation to cap the cost of insulin for American seniors. You know who wrote that? Senator Raphael Warnock wrote that legislation, Georgia. Your senator. And Stacey Abrams has been fighting for a decade to expand Medicaid in the state of Georgia, to ensure that every family in the state of Georgia gets the health care that they need. Georgia, we've come a long way, but we have got a long way to go. So say it with me again now, Georgia. Say vote. vote. Say vote. vote. Say vote. vote. Now please get on your feet and welcome the next governor of the great state of Georgia, Stacey Abrams.
you. Look, I never get tired of saying this. Thank you, Senator John Ossoff. Okay, Georgia, starting tomorrow, we've got 10 days to victory, 10 days to destiny, 10 days to history. And I think you already know this, but Politics 101 says you got to introduce yourself. My name is Stacey Abrams, and I intend to be the next governor of the great state of Georgia. Now, folks look around and they wonder, is this possible? But I will remind you that in 2008, we defied the laws of politics and voted for hope and for change. In 2012, when they said we were done, we came back and we re-elected the 44th president of this United States. We defied the conventional wisdom to deliver generational change, and we are about to do it again, Georgia. We're about to do it again. But before I let y'all come and see the guy you came for, I <laughs> I'm here to say thank you to you. I want to say thank you to the workers and the warriors who survived a pandemic and came out on the other side. I want to say thank you to the resistors and the persisters who understood that we were in a pandemic of racial violence, of gun violence, of attacks on our right to vote and attacks on our freedoms. I want to say thank you to the families that stood strong when others looked down on you. I want to say thank you to the families that stood up when others were sitting down. We have come together in this moment because we know what is possible. We know that we deserve more in the state of Georgia than they've been telling us for a while. We know that by turning to each other instead of turning on each other, we can turn Georgia around. Look, look, Georgia, in 2018, I, I stood for this job, and while my application was not fully accepted, I spent, the, I spent the past four years believing in the possibility of Georgia. And because you believed with me, because you worked with me, we sent Kamala Harris and President Joe Biden to the White House. And because we're Southern, we sent not one, but two U.S. Senators to the White House. We defied history again and again, and we will do it on November 8th, because that is who we are. We are one Georgia, and we believe in ourselves, and we believe in tomorrow. But we're not, we weren't done in 2021. We are not only going to return U.S. Senator Raphael Warnock to his rightful place in Washington, D.C. Look, we're going to make sure he has help. We're going to make sure that David Scott and Nakima Williams, that Hank Johnson and Lucy McBath, that they are joined by the dean of the delegation, Representative Sanford Bishop, because we're going to carry him across the finish line like he's carried us for so long. And right here in Georgia, right under that gold dome, we're going to make sure that I have some friends in January. We're going to have Charlie Bailey and B. Wynn. We're going to have Jen Jordan and William Bodie. Nikita Hemingway, Janice Laws Robinson, Alicia Thomas Searcy. We're going to have candidates for Congress that cross the finish line, and we're going to have candidates for the state and Senate House. We're going to make sure that across the state of Georgia, the wave of blue never stops. Because, Georgia, our time is now. And starting tomorrow, we've got 10 days to change the world. 
Every election is a choice. And for so long, they've tried to make us believe that it's a choice between parties or personalities. But this time, we know it's different. This time, it's an election about the choice between someone who attacks our freedoms and someone who will protect our freedoms. Right now, right now, we have a governor who only looks out for himself and other members of his old boys club. Well, apparently my invitation got lost in the mail, so I'm just going to go ahead and take the keys to the governor's mansion. Because in years, men like Brian Kemp have tried to convince us that they have a poverty of resources. But you know, I know the answer. It's not a poverty of resources. It's a poverty of leadership. And we just struck it rich. We have a state government full of powerful men who like to give power to other powerful men. And they like to use that power to strip us of our freedoms, our freedom to vote, our freedom to be safe from gun violence our freedom to control our own bodies in the state of Georgia. But for the first time, we've got more than we ever could have expected. We've got a diverse ticket that looks like Georgia. And we've got, and we've got $6.6 .6 billion sitting in our coffers right now after we paid our bills, after we put 15% in our rainy day fund. We've got $6.6 .6 billion now. My opponent wants to spend that money on his friends and his cronies. I want to spend it on you. As your governor, I will expand Medicaid as my first act in office. I will prove that in the South, we can protect the Second Amendment and protect second graders. I will raise teachers' salaries. I will support our workers. I will make sure our college students can go to technical college for free and that you can have a C average and still see your way to college in the state of Georgia. And I'm going to tell you all a secret. We can do all of this and we don't have to raise a dime in taxes. All we have to do is raise our expectations and change our leadership. And to put it more plainly, it's time to fire the governor and hire someone new. As your next governor, as your next governor, I intend to stand with you, not on you. I intend to invest with you and fight with you and serve you. I intend for our children to grow up safe and secure, not afraid and cowering. I intend for our small businesses to be front of mind, not last minute thoughts. I intend to be the Maynard Jackson of Georgia. I will fight. I will fight for women's rights because it took a man to break the promise of Georgia. It's going to take a woman to put it right. listen to this all night, but we only got 10 days, y'all. Right now, we are seeing record turnout. And the press, no, 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 because the press is trying to tell us it's a fluke. It's not a fluke, it's a fact. And the fact is, if we want to win, we're going to double down and we're going to show up and show out. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a little bit of instruction. If you have a day to give to knocking and making phone calls, we need your help. I need everyone in this room to commit to spend the next 10 days turning Georgia blue. Look, 
I need you to call people and knock on doors. I need you to call people you haven't talked to for a while. I need you to call people you're mad at, call people who are mad at you. I need you to call people you owe money, call people who owe you money. I need you to call people you broke up with. Hey, look, let's make it the Democratic version. Call people you want to get with, but let's get it done. Because in 10 days, in 10 days, we will have more in the state of Georgia. And if you are with me, every time I point at you, I want you to say the word more. Say more. more. If you want more money in your pocket, say more. more. If you want more opportunity in your neighborhood, say more. more. If you want affordable housing in Georgia, say more. more. If you want Medicaid in Georgia, say more. more. If you want to save our hospitals, say more. more. If you want to save our lives, say more. more. If you want more freedom in our community, say more. more. If you want more for our seniors, say more. more. If you want more for organized labor, say more. more. If you want more for our children, say more. more. If you want more for our veterans, say more. more. If you want more for our seniors, say more. more. If you want to win, say more. more. Say more. more. Say more. more. Now let's get it done. And now, thank you. And now it is my honor to introduce our senator, our reverend, our leader, Senator Raphael Warnock. You all look and sound like you're ready to win an election. I want, first of all, just to say thank you. Thank you. I love you back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the honor of my life. It's a special thing for the people of your state to say that when we consider our families, when we take stock of the moment and of the future. We want you to represent us in high office. That's, that's a sacred trust. I'm honored to be here with you and I'm so deeply honored to be here with my friend my colleague in so many struggles together, and the next governor of Georgia, Stacey Abrams. And to be here with the senior Senator from Georgia, my brother from another mother, John Ossoff. Yeah. 
and with the 44th President of the United States of America, Barack Obama. I'm honored, and I'm still very much amazed at all that has happened. You know, you don't really know for sure that you want a job until you actually get the job. I mean, be honest, some, some of you have lobbied and worked for a job, got the job, and then wanted to tell people what they could. I want you to know that as corny as it sounds, because I have committed my whole life to service, because I've always wanted my life to count and to make a difference in the places that matter, particularly for the most marginalized members of the human family. It sounds corny, but every three or four days I pinch myself because I can't believe that the people of Georgia gave me the amazing honor of representing you in the United States Senate. And while we have gotten a lot of work done, we've got more to do. We're here tonight because we have unfinished business. Are you ready to get it done? And so here's the word. We need everybody to vote. And the good news is that Georgia is turning out early and turning out in record numbers. And we are turning out because we know that a vote is a kind of prayer for the world we desire for ourselves and for our children. We're turning out because we know that your vote is your voice, and your voice is your human dignity. We're turning out because we know that John Lewis risked his life and crossed the bridge so that we might be that bridge to the future. We're turning out because we know Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman, two Jews, and an African-American lost their lives so that John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock, a Jewish man and an African-American man, can serve in the United States Senate. We're turning out because we know that democracy is the political enactment of a spiritual idea. This notion that each of us has within us a spark of the divine. That in our diverse and variegated humanity, we reflect together the glory of God. And so if we have a spark of the divine, we ought to, we ought to have a, a voice in the future of the country and our destiny within it. The vote is a sacred thing. Your, your ballot is a blood-stained ballot. By all means, use it and make sure everybody you know uses it. Long before I served in the United States Senate, long before I became the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church where Martin Luther King Jr. served and preached, I was a kid growing up on the west side of Savannah, Georgia. You're looking at a kid from the Caton Homes housing projects. My mother and my father poured into me a fierce work ethic. My dad didn't let you sleep late. He said, get up, get dressed, put your shoes on. My mother from Waycross, Georgia, Grew up in the 1950s picking somebody else's tobacco, picking somebody else's cotton, 
but she stood with you in 2020 and the wrinkled hands that used to pick somebody else's cotton and pick somebody else's tobacco picked her youngest son to be a United States Senator. <laughs> only, only in America is my story possible. And so I'm not about to give up on the country and I'm not about to give in to the demagogues who are trying to sow the seeds of division because they have no division, they have no vision. I'm going to stand up for the best in the American spirit. And Georgia, Georgia, you're leading the way because you sent me to the Senate and because I haven't forgotten about the bridge that brought me over. Good public policy like the Head Start program, I'm an alum. Upward bound and low interest student loans and Pell Grants. Because I haven't forgotten, I was proud to cast my vote and pass the single largest tax cut for middle and working class families in American history. It's the expanded child tax credit. because I went to Morehouse College on what I call... <laughs> Are there any Morehouse men in the house? Because I went to Morehouse on a full faith scholarship and needed low interest student loans. I was proud to push the president and to secure debt relief for our students because our students Our young people should not have a mortgage before they have a mortgage. It's proud to stand with our veterans. Proud, proud to stand with our law enforcement officers in big cities and in small towns. and proud to stand up for health care because I believe it's a human right. I got arrested a couple of times fighting for health care. In fact, I got arrested one time in the United States Capitol in the rotunda, but because of what you did, every single week I passed through that rotunda on my way to my office where I write bills to expand health care. I wrote the provision to cap the cost of insulin for folks on Medicare to no more than $35 of out-of-pocket costs. Listen, and when I talked about that the other night, as I talked about the fact that we live in a state where 11% of the adults have diabetes, and that insulin is a drug that's been around for 100 years and that they're price gouging the insulin. When I pointed out the ways in which there are bad corporate actors who are gouging a drug that people need that's been around for a hundred years. You know what my opponent said? He said they just need to eat right. Well, while he's blaming the people of Georgia, I'm holding the pharmaceutical corporations accountable. You can't lead the people unless you love the people. You can't love the people unless you walk among the people. You actually have to know stuff to do this job. medicine for seniors so they would not have to choose between buying groceries and buying medicine. 
We gave Medicare the ability to negotiate the price of prescription drugs. And when I pointed out the other night that I have written bills and legislation and I've secured resources to try and get our state leaders to finally expand Medicaid and get 600,000 Georgians out of the Medicaid coverage gap, or the health care coverage gap, as I stood fighting for what I've been fighting for for years, got arrested standing up for it. My opponent, as I talked about the 600,000 Georgians who are in the coverage gap, my opponent said that if you are able-bodied and you have a job, you have health care. Where has he been? Does he know any ordinary people? Does he know any hardworking, struggling Georgians? You? Georgia deserves a senator who understands the struggles of hardworking families, those folk that we called in the midst of a pandemic essential workers. Well, if they are essential workers, they deserve an essential, essential wage. They deserve essential health care. Succinctly put, Herschel Walker is not ready. He's not ready. He's not ready. He's not ready. But not only, not only is he not ready, he's not fit. Not, he, he, he's, he's not fit, not, not to represent the people of Georgia. You, you have to be able to trust the person who's in this office. And listen, it, it gives me no pleasure to say this kind of thing. It gives me no pleasure to say this kind of thing, but after all, I'm a preacher, and so I'm in the business of truth-telling. And this is a man who lies about the most basic facts of his life. In fact, his own staff, his own staff in their exasperation said that he lies like he's breathing. And we all saw it with our own eyes. He wears his lies quite literally as a badge of honor. If, if we can't trust him to tell the truth about his life, how can we trust him to protect our lives and our families and our children and our jobs and our future? Are you ready to win this election? And so let's get the job done, Georgia. We've got to stand up for seniors. We've got to stand up for veterans. We've got to stand up for women and the right to choose. We've got to stand up. We've got to stand up for workers, and we've got to stand up for the future. Are you ready? Let me tell you, I'm, I'm ready. I'm running for re-election not because I'm in love with politics. I put up with politics. I'm, in, I'm, I'm running because I'm in love with change. That's what I'm in love with, change. I'm running because every now and then in this office I get to do something amazing like cast my vote to confirm Katanji Brown Jackson to the United States Supreme Court. And 
as I close, and nobody believes a Baptist preacher when he says, as I close. As I close, I'll never forget the day we confirmed her. The whole chamber was full. The vice president was sitting in the chair. My colleague and friend, Senator Cory Booker, and I were standing there talking to the vice president, waiting on the vote to open. The vice president said, guys, this is such a moment. You really ought to take this moment maybe and write a letter to somebody who comes to mind. She made that suggestion the way so many of the sisters in my life make suggestions. <laughs> and you know what to do. And then she handed each of us a sheet of paper. But it wasn't just any sheet of paper, it was the letterhead of the Vice President of the United States. It didn't take me long to know who I should write that letter to because the only job I loved better than being your senator, the only job I love better than being Ebenezer's pastor is being Chloe and Caleb's dad. My, my precious six-year-old daughter, my four-year-old, almost four-year-old son. And so I sat down and I wrote a letter and I said, Dear Chloe, Today we confirm to the United States Supreme Court, Katanji Brown Jackson. In the long history of our nation, she's the first Supreme Court justice who looks like you with hair like yours. And while we were confirming her, a friend of mine, the vice president, suggested that I write a letter. She's the first vice president who looks like you. I write just to say that in America, in America, you can be and you can achieve anything you set your head and your heart to do. Love, Dad. I wrote that letter to my daughter. I was so filled with emotion, I couldn't wait to fly home. I called her up and I read it to her over FaceTime. She listened. She was not impressed. <laughs> she, she said, can I go and play now? <laughs> She'll understand it better by and by. <laughs> but in the weeks and the months since I wrote that letter, it occurred to me that that's what legislation is. It's a letter to our children. That's what a law is. It's a letter to our children. That's what, that's what public policy is. It's a letter to our children. That's what citizenship is. It's a letter to our children. That's what a vote is. It's a letter to our children. And we ought to ask ourselves what we want that letter to say. I want my letter to say that I stood up in this defining moment in America for the best in the American spirit. I want my letter to say that I stood up for workers that they might have a livable wage. I stood up for women, that they might get equal pay for equal work, that I stood up for our children so that their outcome was not based on their parents' income. I want my letter to say that I didn't sleep through this election. I gave it my all. I left it all on the field because I believe in Georgia. Are you ready to win this election? Let's get this thing done one more time. Keep the faith. Thank you. And now it's my distinguished honor to introduce a man and a brother who needs no introduction, our friend, the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama.
Ronaldo and Leno. It's good to be back in Georgia. Yes, we can. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it's good to be back. Now, my first order of business, I want to find out who's scheduled me after a Baptist preacher. That's a hard act to follow. But I'm, I'm going to do my best. I, I was sitting backstage. Spirit was moving me. Well, I miss you too. I'm glad to be back. Uh, there's a reason that we are holding this rally on a Friday instead of a Saturday. Because the number one team in the country is playing on Saturday, and nobody wants to go up against the dogs right now. The reason I'm here is even simpler than that. I am here to ask you to vote for your next Secretary of State, B. Wynn. For your next governor, Stacey Abrams. For Congressman Sanford Bishop. And to keep the Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock in the United States Senate. You don't have to wait for November 8th to cast your ballot. You can vote right now. Take a few minutes. Vote early at your polling place. They're open now until next Friday. Or you can vote at your polling place on November 8th. And if, if you're not sure how or where to go, just go to IWillVote.com. Let me repeat that, IWillVote.com. Find out where, make a plan. I love you too, but I still want you to vote. And after you voted, I need you to grab your friends and your family, round up Cousin Pookie, make a plan to vote. Take them with you if you vote early. Take them with you if you vote in person on Election Day. because. This election requires every single one of us to do our part. It is that important. Now, I think it's fair to say that this country has gone through some tough times these past few years. We have been through some stuff. We're just now coming out of a historic pandemic that wrecked havoc on families, on schools, businesses, communities. Everybody was impacted. A lot of folks lost people that they love. And the pandemic highlighted, and in some case, cases made worse, problems that we have been struggling with four years. An economy that too often works for those at the very top, but not for ordinary people. Communities where too many of our children are out of school, and then they're out of work, and then they're out of hope, and that sometimes leads them to violence and despair. An erosion of basic civility and democratic norms in our politics, not just here and around the world. And I want to take a moment just to say a prayer for 
a friend of mine, Mr. Paul Pelosi, who was attacked. A politics where, where some in office or who aspire to office work to stir up division, to, to make folks as angry and as afraid of one another for their own advantage. And all of this has been amped up, hyped up, 24-7 on social media, on platforms that oftentimes find controversy and conflict more profitable than telling the truth. So I get why people are anxious. I get why you might be worried. I understand why it might be tempting sometimes just to tune out, to watch football or dancing with the stars. But I'm here to tell you that tuning out is not an option. Despair is not an option. The only, w the only way to make this economy fair is if we, all of us, fight for it. The only way to save democracy is if we, together, nurture it and fight for it. And that starts with electing people who know you and see you and care about you people who will struggle alongside you, people who will fight for you. And that's what you did two years ago when you sent Joe Biden to the White House. Joe is fighting for you every day. He's got your back. He's doing everything he can to put more money in your pockets, to make your streets safer, and bring more good-paying jobs here to Georgia. You did it twice when you voted twice to send Reverend Warnock to the U.S. Senate, along with John Ossoff. And so now you need to do it again. Because there may be a lot of issues at stake in this election, but, but the basic question, the fundamental question that you should be asking yourself right now, is who will fight for you? Who cares about you? Who sees you? Who believes in you? That's the choice in this election. Who, who, will, who will fight? Who will fight for working people who are struggling to pay their bills? L listen, listen. Inflation is a real problem right now. And by the way, it's not just here in America, it's worldwide. It's one of the legacies of the pandemic. So the, the laws of supply and demand got messed up and, and wrecked havoc on supply chains. And then you have a war in Ukraine that is not only in, in, engaging in, in incredible cruelty towards the people of Ukraine, but it also sent energy prices through the roof. So we're seeing gas prices go up, grocery prices, and that takes a real bite out of paychecks. It hurts. But the question you should be asking is, who's actually going to do something about it? The Republicans talk a lot about it, but, but, but what is their answer? What is their economic policy? I will tell you what it is, because it's the same answer they've got for everything. They want to gut social programs, they want to cut Social Security and Medicare, and then they want to give their rich friends a tax cut. Don't boo, vote. And the reason I can say with confidence that they want to cut taxes for the wealthy and for corporations is because that's their answer to everything. When inflation is low, 
let's touch cut taxes. When unemployment's high, you gotta cut taxes. If, if there was an asteroid heading towards Earth, <laughs> they would all get in the room and they'd say, you know what we need? We need tax cuts for the wealthy. That's gonna solve it. How's that gonna help you? And on the other side, you have Democrats like Reverend Warnock who have shown that they will take on the drug companies to lower prices and get the oil industry to clean up its act and, and pass laws to make housing more affordable and make sure big corporations create jobs here in Georgia instead of overseas. Serious answers to serious problems. That's the choice in this election. That's what it's about. If you're watching TV, you've heard a lot about crime. Violent crime has gone up over the last seven years, not just the last two. Not just in liberal states, but in conservative rural states, too. That's a serious problem. Who will fight to keep you and your family safe? The Republican politicians who want to flood our streets with more guns? who actually voted against more resources for our police departments? Is it somebody who carries around a phony badge and says he's in law enforcement? Like he's a kid playing cops and robbers? Or is it leaders like Reverend Warnock and John Asa and Sanford Bishop who worked with President Biden to pass the first major gun safety legislation in nearly 30 years that's the choice in this election. That's what's at stake right now. Who will fight for your freedoms? Is it some of these folks in the GOP, politicians, judges, who think they should get to decide when you start a family, how many children you have, who you marry, who you love? Do not boo. Boo. Or is it Democratic leaders who believe that the freedom to make these personal, intimate decisions belong to every American, not politicians in Washington? That's the choice in this election. That's what you have to decide. And who's going to fight to actually make our democracy work for you? Is it? Some of these folks in the other party that have promised if they get control of Congress, they'll spend the next two years investigating their political opponents. Now, how's that going to help you pay the bills? Or do you stand a better chance with President Biden and Democratic leaders who work together, sometimes with Republicans, to pass an infrastructure bill that will create new jobs? who've made health care and prescription drugs more affordable, who've made the single largest investment ever in the fight against a warming planet. That's the choice in this election between politicians who seem willing to do anything to get power and leaders who share our values, who see you and care about you. Leaders who want to help make your lives better, not theirs. Who want to move this country forward, not backwards. And, and, and let me be clear about this, Georgia. This hasn't always been a partisan thing. My favorite president was a guy named Abe Lincoln. He helped found the Republican Party. It used to be that there were GOP members who championed progress and civil rights and rule of law, even when some Democrats, especially down here in the South, did not. That's part of our history. So it has not always been one party or another. But these days, right now, just about every Republican politician seems obsessed with two things, owning the libs and, and getting Donald Trump's approval. What did I say about Boeing? Vote. But, but, but that 
that's their agenda. It's not long. It's not complicated. And at least to me, it's not very inspiring. They're not interested in actually solving problems. They're interested in making you angry and finding somebody to blame. Because that way, you may not notice that they've got no answers of their own. I mean, I can tell you what Stacey Abrams is, is, is obsessed with. As a small business owner and the daughter of two ministers, she's focused on making sure every Georgian has an opportunity to get ahead. That's why she wants to invest Georgia's surplus in the fundamentals, good schools, a higher standard of living, more affordable health care and housing. That's her agenda. I can tell you what Raphael Warnock cares about. As your senator, he hasn't been off chasing wacky conspiracy theories. He hasn't been drumming up fear and division. He's been working to lower prescription drug costs and boost manufacturing jobs and expand health care for veterans who got sick fighting for the United States of America. That's who Reverend Warnock is. That's his agenda. That's who Stacey Abrams is. That's her agenda. They are both hardworking, God-fearing, community-serving people who tell the truth, stick to their word, treat everybody with decency and respect. Those are the values they bring to bear. Which brings me to Reverend Warnock's opponent. It's a study in contrast. Now, there are a lot of young people here. I, I love, yes. That makes me excited. Some of you may not remember, but Herschel Walker was a heck of a football player. I mean, I, I mean, some of you are, are too young to remember, but in college, he was amazing. One of the best running backs of all time. But, but, but here's the question. Does that make him the best person to represent you in the U.S. Senate? Does that make him equipped to weigh in on the critical decisions about our economy and our foreign policy and our future. That, let, let's do a thought experiment. Let's say you're at the airport and you see Mr. Walker and you say, hey, there's Herschel Walker, Heisman winner. Let's have him fly the plane. You probably wouldn't say that. You'd want to know, does he know how to fly an airplane? Or, or let's say you go to the hospital. And you say, you, you say, you know, that Walker guy, he sure could tear it up at Sanford Stadium. Give him a scalpel. No, you, you wouldn't say that. You'd, you'd ask, at least I would, has he done surgery before? <laughs> and, and, and by the way, the opposite is true, too. Like, you, you may have liked me as president, but you would not want me starting a tailback for the dogs. I mean, can you imagine my slow, old, skinny behind getting hit by some 300-pound defensive tackle who runs a 4 6 40? You'd have to scrape me off the field. No, I can't. No, I can't. I'm good at a lot of things, but that would not be one of those things that I'm good at. <laughs> I mean, I, I can still hit a jumper now, but you wouldn't want me on the football field running between the tackle and the guard. I, my, my point is not that being a football player disqualifies you from being a senator if you had put in the work. But in the case of Reverend Warnock's opponent, there is very little evidence that he has taken any interest 
bothered to learn anything about or displayed any kind of inclination towards public service or volunteer work or helping people in any way. At least we don't really know about it. And that does make you suspect. Seems to me he's a celebrity who wants to be a politician. And we've seen how that goes. We've seen that before. <laughs> and I, and I'll, I'll make one more point. As a general rule, I am not big on poking into people's private lives. I've always felt that that stuff is between a candidate and their family. But you know what's not between them and their family are issues of character. Being in the habit of not telling the truth. Being in the habit of saying one thing and doing another. Being in the habit of having certain rules for you and your important friends and other rules for everybody else. That says something about the kind of leader you're going to be. And if a candidate's main qualification is that he's going to be loyal to Donald Trump, it means that he's not really going to be thinking about you and your needs. And you deserve better. Georgia deserves better. You deserve somebody who's independent and who's going to go work every day and fight for you. Somebody like Reverend Raphael Warnock, who's been doing it all his life responsibly, conscientiously, effectively, not just in the Senate, but throughout his entire career. You deserve somebody who's also going to stand up for a woman's right to make her own health care decisions. Abortion is controversial in this country. And I genuinely believe there are people of good conscience who may differ from me on this issue. But we should all agree that women everywhere should be able to control, have a say in what happens with their own bodies. It shouldn't be controversial to say that the most personal of health care choices should be made by a woman and her doctor, not by a bunch of mostly male politicians. And that's why when the Supreme Court struck down Roe versus Wade, it was a wake-up call for a lot of people, especially young women who may have taken Roe for granted. It was a reminder that a politicized court can reinterpret what we thought were well-settled constitutional rights. It's a reminder that history doesn't just move forward, it can go backward, too. If Republicans take back the House and the Senate, we could be one presidential election away from a nationwide ban on access to abortion. And that might just be the beginning. I taught constitutional law for over a decade, and I can tell you this. If a court does not believe in a zone of privacy that allows us to make certain decisions without government interference, then other freedoms we take for granted are also at risk. And I'm not just making this up. I'm not trying to, you know, get everybody anxious. Justice Thomas wrote as much in the Dobbs opinion. He said as much. If there's no right to privacy, then same-sex marriage could be at risk. Almost every Republican in the House of Representatives has already voted against guaranteeing a right to use contraception. The basis for that original decision saying we had a right to contraception was a right to privacy, a zone in which the government can't interfere. If, if they take power back, there's no guarantee that that won't be next. So all of these issues are at stake in this election. And if that's not worth 15 minutes of your time, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. But 
just in case you need another reason to vote. Consider the fact that democracy itself is also on the ballot. I have to admit, sometimes going out on the campaign trail feels a little harder than it used to. And not just because I'm older and grayer, a little stiffer. Michelle says I'm still cute, though. But back, 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 when I, back when I was first running for office, people didn't agree with me on everything. But we could at least talk to each other. Maybe once in a while we could persuade each other. We could be civil towards each other. And that's why I ended up getting a whole bunch of Republican votes. And after I won, John McCain, my opponent, graciously conceded, gave me a call, publicly wished me luck for the sake of the country. And there was a peaceful transfer of power. That basic foundation of our democracy is being called into question right now. Democrats aren't perfect. I'm the first one to admit it. Politicians, just like all of us, can make mistakes. But right now, with a few notable exceptions, most of the GOP and a whole bunch of these candidates are not even pretending that the rules apply to them anymore. They are just making stuff up. Last year, Stacey's opponent signed one of the most aggressive voter suppression laws in the country. And later on, he admitted he was, quote, I'm, I'm quoting here, frustrated with the results of the 2020 election. So he, quote, did something about it, unquote. Now, let me tell you something. First time I ran for Congress, I was already in the state legislature, I ran for Congress. I lost the primary by 30 points. Got whooped. Whoop! It was embarrassing. <laughs> Had to go out the next day. Had a big L on my forehead. <laughs> and, and let me tell you, I was frustrated too. You know what I didn't do though? I didn't claim that the election was rigged. I didn't try to stop votes from being counted. I didn't incite a mob to storm the Capitol. I took my lumps. I figured out why my campaign hadn't connected to voters. I tried to run a better race the next time. And by the way, I won the next time because that's how our system works. <laughs> Look, I get that I get that democracy might not seem like a top priority right now. One of the more depressing headlines I saw was in, in a, a newspaper. They had done a survey that showed 75% of Americans think that democracy is seriously at risk, but it's not their top priority. But I get that. Folks got bills to pay. They're worried about just keeping, keeping on, getting by. And it doesn't always feel like the political process is working for you when you don't see enough progress on the issues that matter to you and your family. I understand this. But we have seen throughout history, we see now around the world what happens if we give up on democracy. We can see it in other countries where the government tells you what books you can read and cannot read. Countries that put dissidents and reporters in prison. Countries where it doesn't matter who you vote for. The people in power will do whatever they want. Where corruption is rampant because there's no accountability. When true democracy goes away, people get hurt. It has real consequences. 
And that's why generations of Americans have fought and some have died for the idea of self-government and set up rules to make it work. That's why folks right here in Georgia and all across this country fought and some died to make sure that everybody had the right to participate in this government. That's why, that's why we teach our kids, even when they're little, certain rules about what's, what's fair and what's honest. Rules about how we should make decisions together as a group. Everybody gets a say. Everybody gets a turn. If you don't get your way, don't throw a tantrum about it. Don't take your ball and go home. Get over it. Try to do better the next time. And that's what I mean when I say democracy is at stake in this election. That's why it's not enough to elect Democrats at the top of the ticket. We need to elect good people up and down the ballot. Across the country, some of the folks who tried to undermine our democracy are running for offices that will oversee the next election. And if they win, there's no telling what might happen. And that's why we need to work just as hard to elect secretaries of state like B. Wynn. We got to fight for them just like we fight to elect governors and senators who care about you. Because if things get close, they can make all the difference. And guess what? Now you get to make a difference too. You know, we joke in my house, Michelle, she'll admit this, she can be a little glass half empty sometimes. I am the hope and change guy. So I'm usually a little more optimistic. But sometimes Michelle gets down about the state of the country and the state of the world. And I'll tell her, everything will be OK. And I believe it will. But I also know that things will not be OK on their own. We have to fight for this. Democracy is not self-executing. It depends on us working, nurturing, caring for it not just on Election Day, but every day in between. It depends on us as citizens saying, this matters. This election matters, Georgia. These are tough times. The good news, though, is we've been through tough times before. The important thing is to resist the temptation to give up, to turn inward, to see politics as a mean, zero-sum game where anything goes and rules are made to be broken. And the only way for people like us to win is if people like them lose. I don't, I don't believe in those politics. Because even in our darkest moments, and there have been darker moments in this country before, we have always had more in common than our politics suggest. Even when times are tough, what unites us has always been stronger than what divides us. There have always been certain values that bind us together as citizens, no matter who we are, where we come from, what we look like, or who we love. That's the promise of America. That's who we are. And in this election, you have a chance to vote for leaders like B. Wynn and Stacey Abrams and Sanford Bishop and Raphael Warnock, who will fight for that big, inclusive, hopeful, forward-looking America that we believe in, an America that doesn't fear the future, that meets its challenges honestly and boldly, an America where we may not fix all our problems overnight, but where we can make things better. And Atlanta better is worth fighting for. So if you're scared, don't put your head under the covers. If you're anxious, don't put your head in the sand.
If you're frustrated right now, don't complain. Don't tune out. Don't get bamboozled and fall for the okie doke that nothing that you say matters. I need you to get off your couch and vote. Put down your phone and give TikTok a rest and vote. Vote for this whole incredible Georgia Democratic ticket. They'd help your friends and family members, your neighbors and your co-workers do the same. Because enough of us, if enough of us make our voices heard, I promise you, things will get better. We will heal what ails us. We will restore our democracy. We will build a country that is more fair and more just and more equal and more free. That's our task. That's our responsibility. Let's go do it. Thank you, Atlanta. Thank you, Georgia. I love you.